Thanks. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a solution I had to a problem I had at home. So as he said, I go to a bunch of conferences, and once after an extended trip, which was mostly vacation, um, I came home after a heat wave. Um, it was very hot in my apartment. I didn't have a thermometer, but it felt like 45 degrees out in the apartment, and which I could believe because it was about for pushing 40 degrees and the windows were closed. Um, so I live in Poughkeepsie, New York. Um, can't pronounce that. Don't worry about it. Um, that was Tuesday. I had to leave early to avoid that. Um, there's not a lot of heat problems. It's not like Singapore where it's hot all the time. Um, during the winter, we get a lot of snow. During the summer, it gets hot, but not normally above 35. Um, so the heat wave was a little bit strange. Um, because of that, my apartment, which this is the layout from my apartment complex website, um, the furniture isn't where, my furniture isn't where the furniture is here, but um, the apartment didn't really, wasn't really designed with cooling in mind because it's not really, you know, it's not a tropical climate. So these two red bars on the bottom, those are in-wall AC units. And that's the only cooling I have in the apartment besides windows. Um, so during the middle of a heat wave when it's pushing 35, it's um, a little difficult to cool the apartment. Um, this is the window AC unit. That's um, very cheap, very limited control. Um, you can see it's got a fan speed knob and then a uh, mode knob. So top is off and then it's low cool, high cool, and then low fan and high fan. So fan without the um, compressor turned on. Um, and I don't own this. Um, it's included in my apartment rental. Um, so I was, you know, trying to figure out how can I avoid this where my apartment's on fire because I have a lot of computer equipment in my apartment because I'm a nerd and computers and collecting things kind of go hand in hand. I didn't want, you know, to come home to that heat and potentially damage on any of my equipment. So I was trying to think, well, how would I solve this? Well, if I, you know, actually lived in a place where they cared about cooling, they'd have an air conditioner with a thermostat. Almost every modern air conditioner I've ever seen has a thermostat, whether it's rudimentary or you know something complicated. But I don't have that, so I decided I'll build one. Um, so to start the process of building a thermostat, you have to look at what it is, and it's as basic of a closed-loop control device as you can think of. It's you set a point, you control the device, and you sense the temperature, and you just loop on that. It's pretty pretty simple. So I needed to come up with an approach to do those two things. Check the temperature and control the, in this case, my in-wall AC unit. So how would I control that AC unit? Well, I don't own it, so I can't take it apart. My first inclination with, um, would be to rip it apart, figure out how the control circuitry works, splice in a wire, and you know, control it with a microcontroller. I don't own it. I think the apartment complex would not be too happy with me if they have, when I move out whenever, they come in and they see wires sticking out of the AC unit. Um, so I decided not to do that. I um, also have no idea any information about that AC unit. Um, that picture, literally the only identifying mark on it is the GE logo. I have tried to rip the front cover off, which I accidentally ripped the unit out of the wall. Um, there's still, there's no information anywhere about specifically what model it is or how any of the internal um, electronics work. Um, so I had two ideas. I can put a relay on the outlet and just turn it on and off that way and leave it on, leave the switch on and just have relay control power to it. Or I could come up with some convoluted robotic arm thing to turn the knob. Um, went with the relay. Uh, as fun as robotics would be, I don't think I'd be done <laughs> if I tried doing that. Um, and because of the layout of my apartment, I don't want to be running control wires to that relay. So having a wireless relay to control switching on and off the AC would be ideal. So what I decided to use was Z-Wave. Um, Z-Wave is uh, a popular home automation uh, network framework um, that's run by a company. Um, the other popular one in this space is Zigbee. I've used Zigbee before, um, mostly in college for my senior design project. Um, and I would have used that if I was building my own devices. But because Z-Wave is sponsored by a company and has licensing around access to the network protocol, um, 
the devices that come out on it are much more um, interoperable and compatible with each other. And my issue with Zigbee in the past was all of the devices that you buy, it's a spec from the IEEE. It's not, <laughs> it doesn't always work 100%. And if I was building a device, I'd want it to be open all the way down. Uh, Z-Wave has open protocol specs and API specs for interacting with them, but the actual hardware for the network communication is not open. So that, I wish it was, but it's not. So, but because of the compatibility, it's uh, very useful, um, especially for buying things off the shelf instead of building relays or whatever Z-Wave connected device. And they've got hundreds or thousands of devices out there. So I decided to use Z-Wave. Um, and then I looked at how I would control that on a computer. And there turns out there's a very well built open source library for interacting with Z-Wave devices. You can buy a little USB stick that has a Z-Wave uh, transceiver in it. And we'll, you, you use to set up the mesh network for all of the devices in your home. And then Open Z-Wave is a little C library with Python bindings that talks to it. Um, so I just used that. And then I bought that switch, um, which was rated for the current of the AC unit, which I had to measure because I have no idea how much current it actually draws. Um, and then once I had that network set up, I could also use it to leverage more devices in the future. Um, so I could put sensors on it or other devices. They make doorbells, um, locks, all sorts of stuff. So that's also what I did for the temperature sensor in my living room. So if going back to this, there are two AC units, one in the bedroom and one in the living room. So I needed to sense temperature and control in both. I used two of these, one for each AC unit. And then for the living room temperature, because of the way the living room is set up, I needed a wireless sensor. Um, and because it's wireless, I said, oh, I just built a Z-Wave network. I'll just buy a temperature sensor. So I got this multi-sensor, which has temperature, humidity, uh, luminescence, UV, motion, and a bunch of other stuff. I use it for temperature. Um, <laughs> and it, you know, it works pretty well. In my bedroom, didn't want to do that. Um, I had the Z-Wave set up, but that multi-sensor is $60, uh, 60 dollars, 60 US dollars. I don't, that's whatever that is in Singapore dollars. Um, and a lot of money. I also wanted to sense two different temperatures in my bedroom. So going back to the layout, the bedroom is here. I call this my data closet. It's got about four or five computers in it um, and all my networking gear. They, it also has clothes in it because it's a real closet. But, um, so I wanted to sense the temperature in that closet separately from the bedroom because the bedroom one would be used to control the AC, but also monitoring the temper differential between the bedroom and the closet is important because of all the equipment in there. Um, so I wanted to do two separate sensor, two different sensors for that. Um, it also turns out I had a Raspberry Pi sitting in there. You can see two of them. I used the bottom one for some cloud-based uh, orchestration, some software that I developed for my day job. And then the top one was just sitting there because I bought two because they're cheap. Um, so I said, okay, I'll use that Raspberry Pi. Um, and then I started Googling how do you, what temperature sensors do people use with the Raspberry Pi. And one of the popular ones was this DS18B20, which is a Dallas one-wire temperature sensor. So it's, you know, three pins, power, data, and uh, ground. And it's actually, I've actually played a lot with Dallas One Wire when I was in college. Um, so it was a good choice for that. It was also like 50 cents, so a lot cheaper than $60. Um, and the way Dallas One Wire is constructed, you can have multiple devices all in parallel because they're individually addressed. So it would solve my problem for having two at once because I just wired two in parallel, which is what that daughter board is. It's just a little proto board that I wired everything in parallel up to two connectors. And I've got two of those temperature sensors. One is running through the closet into my bedroom, and then the other one is just sitting there underneath the shelf in the closet. Um, so now I have all of the sensor and all the switching. How am I going to control it? Um, I looked out there for some home automation software. Um, a big thing for me was I wanted everything to run locally. I didn't want anything to be dependent on the cloud or an external service. This is controlling my AC. Why do I need to go to someone's server in a data center to turn my AC on? That's crazy. I also am wary of all of the security involved with that and things. And also, you know, the recent S3 outage probably taught everyone that 
you don't want the inter you don't want your data center <laughs> to go down, and then you can't turn your AC off. Um, so I was looking at things that I could host locally. Um, came across Home Assistant, which I have some friends who are very um, active on uh, using and developing. Um, and then I, there were some other ones out there, but Home Assistant really spoke to me because it's written in Python, and I do a lot of Python development. Um, it's fully open source, and it supports like everything. Um, I mean, right now there are over 600 components, and that number keeps growing every release. And because it's Python, it's super easy to write a new component to control any random device, or they even do cloud services. So if you have a cloud service for home automation, it can talk to that pretty easily and integrate it into your local home automation platform. So I decided to use Home Assistant to control it. Another advantage with Home Assistant is it also has really uh, great Z-Wave support uh, with Open Z-Wave. So I said, OK, how am I going to set up a thermostat in Home Assistant? Well, these are the ones they support today. Um, I don't have any of them because I'm building it myself. Most of these are like off the shelf things. Um, there's this generic thermostat, um, which I ended up using. Didn't use it at first though, because Home, Auto Home Assistant lets you write automation rules. So I plugged in all of my sensors and all of my switches and I went about writing all of the rules for how an air conditioner thermostat would work and tried to get it to do the thing. And it turns out it didn't work because automation rules are edge triggered and AC is not. <laughs> um, so, but it turns out someone had already had this problem and wrote a generic thermostat module, um, which I needed to massage to work for an air conditioner because it was designed for space heaters originally. Um, but after throwing some code um, and getting that merged upstream, was able to have a generic thermostat module which could control my AC. So you just define which pair of sensors and switches to control an AC. And then it lets you set a temperature. So this picture is a screenshot that I took yesterday from my home assistant set up at home. This is the web interface um, for it. Um, and I just clicked the living room thermostat. And it's, I'm sorry it's so small. I should have cropped it more. Um, so here is the set temperature of 25C. And you can see because the AC is off and it's also freezing cold and the heat is on in New York, um, it's not even coming close to 25C. Um, but yeah, that's the basics of what that generic thermostat module gives you. But the other thing it gives you is you know, an interface, a software interface to control it. Oh, uh, sorry, I forgot my own slides. Um, this is out of order, uh, I apologize. So the one thing was with these sensors, I needed a way to integrate them into Home Assistant um, to get that, because this Raspberry Pi is not running Home Assistant. It's running on a server that's underneath the shelf in that picture. Um, so I needed a way to get the Dallas One Wire temperature sensors from the Raspberry Pi into Home Assistant. So I wrote some software that pulls the sensor and pushes it over MQTT, and Home Assistant ha can listen to an MQTT broker and subscribe to messages and treat that as sensor data. So that's what I leveraged. And I wrote this software, Dallas MQTT, um, which lets you have an arbitrary number of sensors. It has a YAML file that can, uh, you define which sensor addresses to use. And then it just um, pushes those over MQTT with periodic polling that you set up, and it's multi-threaded to handle arbitrary number of sensors. Right now it only supports one sensor type, which is the one wire thermal temperature uh, sensor from the Linux kernel driver. Um, that's because it just cats that file and pushes it on MQTT after decoding it. But you, it's written in a way where if I had other sensors in the future or anyone had other sensors in the future, they could add on to it. And that's also written in Python because it's really easy. Um, so. One of the issues I had when I first set this up um, was cycle time. Um, something people don't really think about because when they buy a thermostat, uh, when they buy an AC unit, the thermostat's integrated and all of this is done. Um, wasn't done for me. So I plugged, in, plugged everything in, turned it on, said, OK, let's set it to 25C. It's the middle of summer. It's really hot. Um, and this is what happened. You can see it's spiking like crazy. Um, the living room. It was on for four minutes, off for two minutes, and just going like that. And bedroom was about the same, a little bit smaller of a room, so it was uh, whatever. Um, 
turns out ACs are really inefficient um, for about the first 10 or 15 minutes. Depends on the AC unit. And since I don't have the data sheet for mine, just guesstimating. Um, that was a problem. So I had to introduce the concept of hysteresis to Home Assistant, push to patch, and now it's a little bit more spread out. Still some work to do. This was an earlier version. The problem also with this presentation is it's in the middle of a snowstorm, so I don't have any data from more recent patches <laughs> because the AC is turned off. Um, so this is from September, and the other one is from August. Um, but it's um, slow, you know, working it so that um, um, integrating efficiency of the AC into the software. Um, right now, it's done by hand. In the future, I would like to use um, real-time data from that sent from that switch, which also measures power consumption, to try to figure it out. Because I could graph power consumption, figure out efficiency curves based on that, um, j just by analyzing the data. But for right now, it was just. I was able to solve it by introducing the concept of hysteresis to Home Assistant's thermostat module. Um, so now that I had everything working, um, I wanted to see what else I could do. Um, so I started looking at the home automation rules in Home Assistant. This is a basic rule. Um, most thermostats that you buy today have set points that you can set throughout the day. So you know, if it's after midnight, you turn the AC off so you're not wasting power. Um, so I decided, I started experimenting with automation with that. So that's what this rule is. Um, I'm a night owl, so after 12.30 AM, turn the AC to 30 degrees, which won't ever turn on normally in New York. And then um, after 9.30, ignore that rule. That's all it says, um, and you can see pretty straightforward YAML syntax to define that. And that was the starting point for writing automation rules for figuring out, OK, what can I do with, now that I have a computer controlling my AC, what else can I do with it? The first thing that popped in my head was location tracking and geofencing. Um, so it's a computer. I've got, a, I've got multiple computers on me all the time. How could I write rules? for it to control my AC based on where I am. Um, should I, I can set the temperature higher when I'm not home, and I can pre-cool the apartment when I'm coming home, so I don't come home to a 45 degree apartment anymore. I have a set point for you know, static temperature so things don't catch fire, but you know, I don't need to set it at 25C when I'm not home, but I'd like it to be 25C when I get home so I'm not sweating. So I looked at what Home Assistant offered, and they had a module for something called OwnTracks, which is an Android and iOS app that's open source that just reports your location over MQTT. And you can push MQTT to a cloud service. I think a lot of the cloud providers have IoT things now um, that have just an MQTT broker. Or you can run your own. And since I was conscious of not having services have my data, especially location data, um, I said, OK, I'll just run an MQTT broker. And I've got it encrypted. and locked off, try to be secure. Um, and then it just, you know, it reports where I am. I was looking at the map earlier today. It knows I'm in Singapore. It doesn't do anything because it's a snowstorm and the AC is off. But it, I could write a rule based on that. So now that I have piped my location info into Home Assistant, I can control how the AC functions based on my normal schedule when I'm at home. So I work from home. And to get out of my apartment so I actually talk to people, I work from Starbucks for a couple hours at least every day. Um, so I wrote a rule that says, OK, when my phone is at Starbucks and leaves, wait five minutes and then set my temperature to 26. So that um, the wait five minutes is because of the time it takes me to drive from my house to Starbucks um, and through experimentation how long it takes to cool off the apartment. and then. The temperature, so it's cool. So it pre-cools my apartment as soon as I leave Starbucks, which I think is pretty neat. Um, and I've started writing rules for this for other common locations that I go to, like the airport. Um, so where am I going to go with this? Uh, well, that location example taught me that with more sensors, you can have more automation, and even in combinations that you wouldn't have thought of. So the thing I was talking about before with the adjustable hysteresis, maybe doing that automatically with power usage collection, 
which is something that I need to fix on the Z-Wave sensor side. Um, you could do something there. Another thing is my parents have solar cells at their house. I don't have them in my apartment, but they have solar cells in their house, and that's fully metered. You, what if you could take the solar data and control other electronics in your house so you run things that you wouldn't normally run when you're having excess power generation? Or, you know, a lot of people use this same platform for things like controlling lights and blinds when they watch TV or other stuff. But there, these combinations of things is where the real power is in in this kind of stuff. And that's, you know, simple things you don't even think about, like a thermostat. Everyone has one, but then, if, you know, what could you do with a thermostat if you could talk to all of the other things you have? And you don't have to do that in a way that's, you know, crazy and scary and insecure like teddy bears that listen to parents. Um, you can do it all yourself in, in your house in a way that it's all owned by you. And that's, that's what I really find interesting about this. So I push some links up here, and I'll go back to the title page. All of the slides are on GitHub, um, so you can see the source on how I generated graphs and stuff, too. But these are just some, some of the things I used in a paper that I read from 1986, which was the last time people studied air conditioner cycle efficiency, because that was when solid state electronics came out. Um, and the next slide is just questions, so I'll leave this up. Um, does anyone have any questions? How am I on time? <laughs> Thinking about putting a, like a PID control circuit on the, on the, um, on the thermostat, like the software? Yeah, um, I had. That's it. Just requires writing it. That's uh, <laughs> yeah. I had thought about that too. Yeah. Just a poor man's notion. Just don't stop it for five minutes. So that, that's essentially what the hysteresis thing I introduced was. It's. Um, I forgot what I called it because I didn't want to call it hysteresis because a lot of people use it, aren't familiar with the term. I think I called it minimum cycle wait time. Yeah, so it's like, so I have it set to like five or ten minutes right now and I've been adjusting it based on my power bill. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. And that's what this paper is actually about because PID controllers came out in the 80s and <laughs> people were putting them on AC units saying, oh, it makes it better because it runs less. Yeah. Is it actually, I mean, uh, our friend are being helpful for the uh, appliances on this thing? Because it just shut down the whole thing, right? Yeah. So I don't own the AC unit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is it like if you are using for other electronic stuff, can then you just shut down? I mean, it's, it's a power relay. So if the device doesn't like being power cycled, it's not going to like it. Because, I mean, when I push the button on Home Assistant, I hear the relay click. It's literally, like, I think it's a 20 amp relay. Um, so if the device you're using to control with that doesn't like to be switched on and off, probably don't do it. I don't know about this AC. I don't really care. <laughs> yeah, they don't like it on and off too quickly, which was the cycle time bug. Um, but, you know, maybe other electronics won't have that problem. It looks analog, so it could be that you actually consume more power turning it off and on. So yeah. Be as well. Yeah. So how's your uh, latency on Z-Wave? I mean, you can do it when you start to like uh, send a command over. It oh, it's it's really quick. Um, yeah. I was surprised how quick it was because I I mean I did Zigbee stuff. It's probably like six or seven years ago now, and it <laughs> there were a lot of issues with communication and delay and. I was surprised how good Z Wave was. So, yeah, have you thought of like, you know, introduce your like, voice command or something? Like uh, so, that's something that Home Assistant has support for Alexa and maybe a couple of other ones. I mean, it's really easy, it's all Python. Someone actually did Alexa because it's cheap and easy to get one of the little Echo things. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it has, it has voice control with, through other devices or other APIs, and it's integrated into Home Assistant. So if I wanted that, I could put it in. But you still need to connect to the internet, right? Yes, for that you do. But that, Home Assistant doesn't care if the component you're using talks to the internet or not. I do. <laughs> um, that's, that's the distinction. But yeah, no, they've got a lot of, like if, um, well, big images. Like these, um, I know for example, the Honeywell thermostat, uh, just screen scrapes from their website, so it just uses a, well, it's not actually screen scraping, it just does the HTTP request to the Honeywell 
um, cloud-connected thermostat website and pulls the data down and sends commands that way just with raw HTTP, but it, you know, it auths against their cloud service. So, you know, if their cloud service goes down, then you can't control your thermostat except to go and touch it because it's an actual thermostat. So I, it's running on a, an unrelated server that I have sitting in the house. But people run it on Raspberry Pi. They also have a prepackaged distribution, an SD card image that you can just stick in a Pi. Yeah. 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 It's 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 real simple to use. I've been real happy with it. Is the Z-Stick is all connected to the machine that's running the home assistant? Yeah, it's, so the Z-Stick has to be on the same box as the home assistant because it uses open Z-Wave and it's just local USB connection. Good on time? Yeah, we're running out of time. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs>